Nothing But The Truth. Hello, I'm Raj Chengap of India Today and your host for Nothing But The Truth. Every week we analyze key issues of concern and bring you perspectives and clarity as to why these matter to you. So in this episode, we will look at the stunning meltdown of the Sheikh Hasina regime in Bangladesh and why it is such a huge diplomatic and strategic setback for India. Also how the Modi government should update and reinvent its neighborhood first policy to meet these new challenges. First, let's analyze why India's neighborhood has become such a hotbed of upheaval and unrest. Earlier, the popular phrase was that power emanates from the barrel of the gun or from the jackboot of dictators. But now increasingly in South Asia, power emanates from the people themselves. Sheikh Hasina's inglorious ouster is the latest illustration of what one could see as popular rage that is truly coursing through the subcontinent. We are all witness to how Hasina, who was Prime Minister of Bangladesh since 2009, had to flee her own country and take refuge in India and had only 45 minutes to catch a helicopter and come here. In fact, if you look back at the past four years, uh, the entire South Asian region has been engulfed with similar episodes. In Myanmar, the military-led dictatorship, uh, which had sacked the democratically elected government in uh, 2021, today faces a bloody civil war that has seen rebels uh, take control of almost half its territory. Half its territory. In Sri Lanka, the powerful Rajapaksa brothers, Gothabaya and Mahinda, who as president and prime minister respectively, had treated the island nation like a family fiefdom, finally had to flee uh, to safety in 2022 after people's revolt. And we saw the same scenes that played out in uh, Sri Lanka, play out too in Bangladesh. Uh, it's amazing how similar they looked with crowds going and storming the presidential palace in uh, Sri Lanka and here the prime minister's house in Bangladesh. Then in 2023, the Pakistan army saw the unthinkable happen when mobs protesting the arrest of deposed Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan stormed into the Lahore co-commander's house. Now, the army runs uh, Pakistan. It is the establishment that rules. And for the army to be challenged uh, in such a manner was unprecedented. So if there is a common thread through these four events, it is that they have all, if you noticed, emanated out of popular rage. And the main cause is economic the lack of jobs, high inflation and low incomes with the young uh, expressing their angst and anger and in many cases resorting as we saw to mass uh, violence to bring about radical change. Now these are not very good trends. Even in India in the recent general election the ruling BJP too uh, felt the heat of this popular discontent which, uh, which in some senses uh, resulted in its inability to win a majority of seats in the Lok Sabha on its own, as it had done in the previous two terms. So, there is a big lesson for all South Asian na uh, nations, including India, not to take its people for granted. The other takeaway is that it is now the youth and the aspirational class that is, uh, that, uh, who are the driving forces of all this discontent. They are equipped with the power of social media and with that, we have seen they can shake the foundations of any, any, any political dispensation. And this is what is the big change that is happening. Now, the irony is that in Bangladesh, much of Sheikh Hasina's reign saw tremendous economic growth. And in fact, it had become the poster country for development. But post-COVID, and that was the turning point. The economy failed to recover and the income inequities grew uh, with it uh, because there was soaring inflation, falling exports and remittances. That's one of the things that the subcontinent uh, depends so much on, including India. That fell as well. And the lack of jobs saw widespread discontent. That's why the quota issue uh, for jobs in Bangladesh uh, became the spark that triggered the explosive protests for students. It was also Hasina's arrogant mishandling of the protests 
that saw over 300 protesters being killed, which was truly the la last straw in many senses. In the last four years of her reign, Hasina had become even more authoritarian, clamping down on the opposition uh, and corruption apparently had become rampant. The disillusionment of uh, the population had truly set in and yet, and this is where we come to India, India continued to back Hasina. Now, there was good reason for India backing uh, Hasina, uh, Sheikh Hasina in, uh, in Bangladesh because Bangladesh shares a 4,000 uh, land uh, border with India. So if you look at the map, it's one of the longest borders that India has with any neighbor. It is situated where Bengal, West Bengal, abuts the northeast through the narrow uh, but very critical Siliguri corridor. This makes it vital to India's strategic uh, calculus in many senses. Despite India's substantial role uh, in its war of independence of 1971, uh, relations between the two countries, Bangladesh and India, steadily deteriorated after that. Especially after Sheikh uh, Mujibir Rehman, the founder of the nation, and uh, Sheikh Hasina's father was assassinated in 1975. The successor regimes were hostile to India. Hasina's arch rival, Khalida uh, Zia, who had uh, two stints as Prime Minister in 1991 to 96 and 2001 to uh, 2006, was a troublesome period for India. Khalida Zia uh, gave shelter to anti India elements, including Northeastern rebels, and India was very, very unhappy with that process that was there. But when Hasina swept to power in 2009, India had a dream run thereafter. In fact, in the past decade or so, uh, India, thanks to Hasina's uh, cooperation, has been able to settle uh, the land disputes uh, between the two countries amicably. That was something that had been pending for years and that got sorted out. There was um, immense, um, immense amount of construction of major infrastructure projects, including the transboundary connectivity between the two countries, and all these picked up substantially. The other reason was that, uh, and, and why India wanted her to continue, was that Hasina had kept the forces of Islamic extremism, uh, extremism in her country at bay, and weakening her would not only unleash such forces, but also, remember China's right there, uh, uh, you know, knocking on the days, uh, do doors of, Bay, of the Bay of Bengal, and uh, it would also encourage the Chinese to make bolder advances into this particular region. So India had placed all its bets on Hasina, ignoring her growing authoritarian streak. And now experts are blaming India for not putting the guardrails of democracy and warning Hasina against crossing them. The ag anger against India spilled out on Dhaka streets, as we saw uh, after Hasina's ouster, and there are reports. Uh, sad reports of homes of uh, the minority Hindu uh, community being allegedly targeted and some Hindu temples even being desecrated. Of course, there is no confirmation of that. And so while the situation seems to be calming down, um, but an unstable Bangladesh with a hostile dispensation to India is something of serious concern to us. I spoke to former Foreign Secretary Harsh Shringla, who had also served by the way, as the High Commissioner to Bangladesh from 2016 to 2019, three years, where Hasina was truly at her elements. And he told me, uh, it's important for India to work with the new dispensation, and I'm quoting him on this, uh, so that there is continuity to the level of progress uh, for both ourselves and for the people of Bangladesh. And he went on to tell me, any instability or, or the lack of goodwill on the part of the new administration in Bang Bangladesh could impact us in the Northeast and on such issues as transit and connectivity. And so, and this is a very important statement he makes, cooperation for mutual benefit is best for both neighbors. That is virtually almost uh, like the official India stand uh, that's there, but it is to be seen how the situation develops uh, and uh, the way uh, Bangladesh broke out and the kind of insurgency that happened in Bangladesh and the protests and the outbreak and the fact that Sheikh Hasina had to flee should make India policy, Indian policy makers pause and rethink our entire strategy of neighborhood first. Now I spoke to Ashley Tellis, who's a top US expert on subcontinental issues, who works with a prominent think tank in Washington DC, 
and he pointed out uh, and he in fact was a bit sympathetic to India because he said India's curse uh, is that it is surrounded uh, by countries riven by deep domestic political cleavages. So the result is that we have a constant yo-yo like relationship with these nations a kind of an up and down process. Uh, so uh, for a while there is a dramatic improvement in relations when pro-India parties come to power as we saw in Bangladesh. But things go rapidly down when alternative political forces gain ground as we saw in Maldives recently where we had a pro-India government before 2023 and once the new uh, Maldives government came in anti-India sentiments began to grow. So experts say that the playbook uh, that India had adopted to deal with such cases looks dated. Another top expert, Arvind Gupta, a former Deputy uh, National Security Advisor of India, um, uh, he was also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or External Affairs and currently he is the director of the Vivekananda Foundation. And he says, and this is very, very important, he says, our neighborhood is imploding and we can expect many more such events in the next few years. So it is going to be our number one foreign policy priority, which means that India has to focus on its neighborhood. And he goes on to tell me, we must go back to the drawing board for our neighborhood policy and do a complete reinvention. Uh, and he believes that is required. I, I also spoke to another expert, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, uh, who is a former national security advisor and uh, foreign secretary. And again, he is a uh, top expert in the subject and he said bluntly, and this is something that the Modi government uh, should take note of, he said, let's face it, most Indians, including the establishment, have been acting as if uh, we have outgrown the neighborhood, that is, India has outgrown the neighborhood, and India seems to be more interested in the G20, the US and Russia, and our record, he says, in the neighborhood uh, is patchy, and our commitment to them in terms of aid has diminished over time. Now, uh, another former foreign secretary, and I'm giving these viewpoints because I think it's very important to see uh, and to come uh, as to why these are such important points to take note of, because we have seen that right in our doorstep, this tremendous unrest, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it is uh, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, we're seeing the problems in Pakistan. And he said, when I spoke to him uh, about uh, this, he talks of uh, really, a structural issue that needs to be sorted out. And he, and, and he explains it this way. Uh, he says that we've been talking about the neighborhood first policy for quite some time. It's almost a decade. But do we have the established wherewithal and resources that must be deployed to give substances to it? And one example he points out is that when it comes to human resources, the people that are required for it, uh, the ministry, you, he says you can't have a ministry of external affairs that is only a couple of pe persons dealing with neighboring countries. So that's a very important thing. When you look at it, you need a lot more people on the ground, not just uh, MEA people, but across in terms of think tanks and others to come up with a playbook that is updated and will be able to deal with this huge new problem that is breaking out across uh, our neighborhood. Now, there are critical signs and that's why it's very important that we listen to these experts and uh, get their suggestions as to how we can move forward because there are already signs that uh, India is losing hold in the neighborhood. And if you look at, uh, as mentioned, the Man uh, Maldives, and you, uh, if you look at the uh, change in regime that happened in 2023, uh, in this vital outpost uh, of the Indian Ocean, uh, where we saw uh, the regime move from a pro-India to a pro-China regime, and we saw uh, Mohammed uh, Musil, uh, who won the presidential elections, actually campaign on what is called an India out which meant that uh, he, you know, he didn't want Indians to be around. And as soon as he took charge in November last year, he ordered all Indian military personnel to leave and canceled several earlier defense agreements. Now, when he said India out, it didn't mean that tourists uh, shouldn't come. But the fact was that when India said, uh, and there were a lot of circles in India that said boycott uh, Maldives uh, and don't go there, Maldives then began to tone down its rhetoric because they knew that this is the leverage that India has, that if it doesn't, Indians are among the biggest tourists uh, who visit, uh, uh, in terms of numbers, the biggest tourists who visit Maldives. And the feeling was that uh, if Indians didn't come, it would impact the economy. And that's when he began to tone down the rhetoric and in fact came for the swearing in ceremony of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. But 
that is, you know, meanwhile, and this is what India needs to worry about, is that he went on to sign 20 agreements with China to reduce the Maldives dependence on India for food imports, health facilities and trade. So that's something we need to look at. When we turn to Nepal, now uh, there is the return of Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli uh, uh, just in July, mid-July, and he is seen as pro-China, and this is not a development that India is comfortable with. Now, that is because in his previous stints, uh, uh, Prime Minister Oli had actively cultivated better relations with China and entered into several agreements to build infrastructure projects that had India uh, gnashing its teeth in anger in some senses. So uh, I spoke to former Indian ambassador Ranjit Ray, who's again a top expert. He was uh, um, ambassador to uh, Nepal and he gives a very timely warning against being complacent and he says the Chinese and Americans are very active in Nepal and India should be far more engaged with all players in the country. And very, very important, he points to Bangladesh and what happened over there and he said we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket as we did in Bangladesh. Meaning that we not only have to engage the ruling party but all the opposition and make sure that we have a good equation with them so if the regime changes there is not this yo-yo effect that is happening. Now, let's take another uh, country which we share a very long border with, uh, which is Myanmar. And there, many experts say that the Modi government is in danger of making the same mistake it did in Bangladesh. And why? Because India continues to back the military dictatorship, though it has become or it is seen to be widely unpopular. Now, here again, the, it is the youth that are leading the unrest against the country's poor economic situation. Uh, Myanmar, in fact, has a negative GDP growth. I spoke to Gautam Mukhopadhyay, uh, who is a former Indian ambassador to Myanmar, and he says, and he warns, and he says that India is being perceived as being with the ruling uh, military junta, which means that a majority of uh, Myanmar's population views India negatively. Now, Myanmar, and that's very important, what he says, is being now driven uh, by federal and democ democratic sentiments. So although the rebels have captured almost half the territory, they want a unified uh, Myanmar with federal characteristics because there are a lot of groups that are there that are quarreling with each other, but they are united in the stand that the military dictatorship should go. And the problem, uh, Mukhopadhyay says, Gata Mukhopadhyay says, is that India has the opportunity of not being a pale imitation of China, which is actually using uh, all these uh, uh, varying uh, uh, factions over there and talking to them uh, but really not pushing through uh, a settlement and he says India should use its biggest calling card which is to push for a democratic federal system in Myanmar, uh, Myanmar similar to what we have. And then he goes on to say unfortunately we don't seem to be reading the writing on the wall and we remain pro status quo. Of course um, there are many other experts who say that probably it's still a good thing to engage with the military because uh, under the constitution, the military uh, leaders get 25%, uh, serving military leaders get 25% of the total seats are being, are in, the, in their parliament is reserved for them. So the military will always remain a strong force. We need to balance, uh, uh, probably the way out is to balance not only keeping our relations with the military, but also ensuring that all the other factions we are in touch with and we have an equation with them. Now let's take, uh, finally, uh, when it comes to Pakistan, um, India is, uh, as we're seeing, suffering the backlash of the unstable political situation there. I won't go too, too much into details of that. We've seen what happened to Imran Khan, his ouster, and uh, the uh, elections, which has really didn't uh, clear, clear, uh, throw up a clear mandate. And uh, of course, we ha now have Shabash Sharif as Prime Minister, but it is the army that continues to hold the cards there. And here, uh, with Imran Khan seemingly on his way back, the army, the Pakistan army, is returning to its old game plan of using proxies to execute terror attacks in India. Uh, and this is done in a bid to strengthen their hold over the political, or, or hold over their own country. Uh, so the target this time, as we've noticed, is Jammu. And the idea seems to be to disrupt the assembly, upcoming assembly elections in Jammu and Kashmir and bring the valley back to center stage so that national security becomes a key issue in Pakistan again. That's the army's game plan and uh, it is unfolding as we see it. Clearly, they are discomforted by the fact 
that their efforts to uh, get a democratic setup that was, uh, you know, amiable to them seems to be uh, unraveling and Imran Khan is making a comeback. And so let us see how that uh, arrangement happens. But for us, it's bad news because Pakistan has again started its terror strikes after a period of calm. Uh, and in fact, we had an agreement at the line of uh, control of, of a ceasefire, but that seems to be in danger now. What we also have to look at, and this is the biggest neighbor that we have to look at is China, which we have seen as up the ante in the past five years uh, with the unprecedented uh, intrusions on the line of actual control in the Galwan Valley in Ladakh and then went right across and this was in May 20 in the thick of COVID. And we saw armed forces uh, personnel from both the sides uh, lose their lives in clashes for the first time in 50 years. So the situation is very serious and the border standoff so relations between the two countries plumb to new nadir uh, new nadirs and despite the fact that we've had 21 rounds of military talks china has refused to pull back from some of the vantage points it had occupied and there is a stalemate that's on meanwhile sensing india's vulnerabilities in its relations with china neighboring countries have frequently played one against the other often forcing india to go back to go, go on the back foot and scramble to restore parity. So they've, the games that uh, the South Asian nations, uh, our neighbors that are playing is that they play us uh, against China and uh, then we're trying to bring parity. And so this is something that uh, uh, we, we need to plan against uh, to work out how we can take on the challenge of China, which increasingly has very aggressive intent in the subcontinent. Now, that brings us to the question as to how does India reinvent and rejuvenate its neighborhood first policy. Most experts that I spoke to advocate a massive, a massive push towards economic integration with its neighbors and a willingness to spend big bucks as China did with its Belt and Road Initiative. You remember China is willing to put on huge sums of money, invest huge sums of money on building infrastructure projects, whether it's in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, our entire neighborhood, they, Myanmar, even uh, in Maldives, they have come uh, in a big way to do these infrastructure projects, uh, projects that's there. And these are economic. So uh, what, uh, when I uh, uh, spoke to Shivshankar Menon, uh, he's among the one who believes that India should move to what he calls just the security paradigm, uh, which is currently, he says, uh, which is India's mainstay of, in the neighborhood, to a policy that focuses instead on providing economic stability and enhancing prosperity to our neighbors. So he's, he's calling for a shift, which says that rather than just focus on our security concerns and have relations with them on that, we need to build, uh, uh, put investment, put our money, <laughs> money where our mouth is, and uh, build up investment and infrastructure projects and uh, you know, econo uh, further their economic uh, interests and have, uh, in, in, as a result, prosperity in these regions. And that, he said, is a better binding force than just security that's there. And he had a, uh, uh, added a very, very important condition. Uh, he said India should not push for reciprocity with its neighbors. But, uh, like the doctrine enunciated by the former Prime Minister I.K. Gujral, the late I.K. Gujral, we should give our neighbors more than what we take from them. Now that's an important thing that is there, that we are the big brother, we are perceived to be that, and it is important that we show that we are willing to concede a little more and to, for the peace and stability of the region. Now Ashley Tellis, who I talked to earlier, said that uh, India should take a leaf out of China's playbook. And this is a very, very smart thing to do, where he said India should work towards making its enemies dependent on it. Now why sh should that be important? Because if you pursue an aggressive trade policy that uh, enhances regional integration, then what happens is those countries, as I said earlier, when, uh, when we talked of Maldives, if, for instance, you begin to threaten their tourism or any economic activity, they begin to quieten down on their anti-India rhetoric. Now, that's a very, very important thing that needs to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a card that you can play if you build economic uh, integration, which means that you build roads that connect it, you have trade, uh, you ensure that uh, other forms of connectivity, like uh, uh, including buying electricity or power projects that have grids. So the, the chances of them, uh, you know, getting uh, uh, completely going the other way, the yo-yo factor lessens. Now, Sham Saran agrees and says that, uh, and he says uh, that is what is important is to have a range of such engagements 
that uh, ensure what he calls long-term interdependence and, he, and the way he puts it, that can prevent the suicidal compulsions for incoming hostile political dispensations who want to, who are not pro-India and would like to take, uh, you know, a pro-China stance, stance and this would dissuade them. So, uh, let us look at, uh, really, there is a very good example that, Sri Lanka, uh, that we have, which is Sri Lanka. And uh, this is where the Modi government played its cards very well uh, after the economic crisis uh, of 2022. If you recall the scenes uh, that happened where I told, uh, the, you know, uh, rioters in, uh, stormed the presidential palace in uh, Colombo. And this crisis had uh, plunged the island nation into uncertainty. India stepped in. At that time, there was huge uh, economic problems that they faced, uh, you know, soaring inflation, uh, the uh, fuel prices had gone up considerably, food prices had gone up, and uh, as was uh, petrol. And India stepped in and extended uh, financial aid worth $4 billion. That's an uh, enormous amount of money, in fact, more than what the IMF had chipped in for Sri Lanka subsequently. And even as Chinese FDI, Chinese had invested very heavily before this crisis, uh, and even as Chinese FDI dried up in the past four years, India pumped in close to $500 million uh, in investments. India's private sector giants also stepped uh, to the plate with ITC and Adani Group making huge investments in private projects. ITC had a hotel project uh, come up. Uh, Adani had uh, built port projects and uh, was also getting to wind energy there. And so all this, the mix of timely aid, financial assistance and big ticket private investments has resulted in a favorable shift in attitude on Colombo streets towards India. And that's important. Now, that is a very good example of how if India invest wise, invest wisely on a troubled nation as we did with Lanka, and remember, Lanka's also had a yo-yo relationship with India, but now they, because of the investments we made, they are more likely to view India favorably, and that's critical. Now, absolutely critical, and this is my uh, final point on this issue, is developing a strong regional trade association and pushing through a free trade agreement that can boost intra-regional trade. And many experts talk of this as being the game changer in our relations. Now, we did try that. It's not like India didn't uh, try to do that. Uh, if you recall, we had the South Asian Association for Re Regional Cooperation, but that got derailed because of India-Pakistan hostilities. So India then bypassed Pakistan by setting up uh, what is called the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and economic cooperation, a very big word, uh, and the acronym is BIMSTEC, and they set it up way back in 2004, and this comprised of seven countries, that was uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, and India. It ex excludes, of course, Pakistan and China. However, and this is one of our issues that we should be concerned about, the grouping that India formed has only had five summits uh, meetings in the past two decades. That's a summit meeting every four years, and it has dragged its feet over agreeing on an FTA, a free trade agreement. Now, this is something we need to speed up. So, there is no doubt that more than political uh, and security considerations, we need to push, uh, India needs to push for a massive regional economic and trade integ integration. And that is the way forward to insulate ourselves and ensure ourselves against the kind of uh, vagaries and the upheavals that are ha happening in our subcontinent. I will end by quoting uh, former Prime Minister uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, who once remarked, you can't change your neighbors, but you can change your friends. India's endeavor should now be to turn its neighbors into friends rather than be a natural magnet for their resentment because of its massive size and proximity. Thank you for being with me in this episode of Nothing But The Truth. For more details, you can read the latest issue where I've done an in-depth cover story on India's neighborhood policy. And I look forward to having you with me next week. Nothing But The Truth.